We've got another exciting VCR to look at today. Panasonic AG6800. It's a VHS with hi-fi audio and normal audio. It's some kind of more industrial machine that I think you can use for or aimed at duplication and industrial medical education use but uh, it also can function as an edit feeder as far as I know got all the usual sort of controls you'll find earphone output audio monitoring type of audio you can make it just normal not hi-fi there's a tape remaining indicator that's quite nice yeah, various functions on this display. Yeah, I thought there's another model that's got a jog dial thing there, but that's not this one. Oh well. Uh, let's have a look at the back. It's quite heavy. We're going to take it apart today. Just got a fan. Got separately the HD audio out. A remote connector, which is exciting. The various other things, video in and out, audio, record remote. Then a TV connector which is quite nice. That gives you audio and video input and output. Voltage selector, a power switch, an hour meter, which has a little bubble which moves from one side to the other. Pretty sure it's fully moved. Yeah, but this remote connector you can use for remote controlling it. So I've got, I couldn't find the full editing remote control that I've got. I don't know where it is at the moment. It's hiding away somewhere. But this is the add-on to it which you connect up VTR and then there's these extra link cables which join this controller onto the main one so you can add another player into your linear, linear editing system and so this can supposedly remote control the machine. We'll try that out so the cables that go with this, which plug into here, I don't want to touch them because they've gone really gross and sticky, which is very disappointing. So here, I've tried wiping them before, but I think there's oily stuff coming out of the cables, and so they're really horrible to touch now. So these, this here is a linking cable which allows you to connect additional players up to your edit system. So that will go back to the main editing controller. I'll find it along with the other bits and pieces that you use to create an editing system with this generation of equipment. And we'll look at a, an actual editing VCR that uses this stuff and can do insert edits and things. Uh, so yeah, that plugs into the machine. And this plugs into the editing controller. Or the additional player controller thing, which is what this is. That is quite neat connectors. You can see there's a latch thing in there which hooks onto that hook there. Quite nice. Don't need this for now. So we're going to try this out. Pretty sure it doesn't work, but we'll try it out anyway. Uh, we'll just have to get this hooked up so that we can turn it back around. Uh, hook up a video connector just in case we get something out of it. Okay, it's powered up. You can see how slow the, the, the well it's not slow, but yeah, how close to the refresh rate of the display the camera is, which is interesting. So you choose what you want to insert, and then you can do it. But we've got to put a tape in, but I want to take the cover off so we can have a look at it as well, because we've got to have a look at stuff. I had a couple of these machines, and I've already got rid of one. I remember one of them had huge amounts of rust inside it, which was quite weird. Like the whole inside cover was rusted and peeling off. And I'm fairly confident this won't work. Although in the notes I had, one of them wouldn't even power up, so I guess I could end up that one, because this one is powered up. The display is lit up. It's interesting that for this age, it's still shows the Panasonic name. I guess this is an international version because it's got the voltage selector on it. So let's call it Panasonic. 
so it doesn't get confused with other trademarks or whatever which the national name had trouble with outside of Japan. Got lots of these cables and yeah they're all gone horrible. Because I got a bunch of this stuff which takes these controllers. Oh yeah that had rust in it. So we can see that it's got the additional pickups off the video head for the hi-fi audio. So that comes off the top. It's a very old mechanism. It's got that extra roller there that they used to have back in the day. And it's got a mirror on the thing so that when the tape's in there you can look from the front and see the, the reels in the tape, which is quite neat. It's all completely metal chassis. All the stuff is metal. Let's, should we just go straight into it and put a tape in? Slipping. Okay. The loading belt is slipping. Okay, I'll have to manually help get the tape in. There we go. Now, let's see, will the remote work? It does. Oh, but it's not in play mode. I wonder if that again is a belt slipping that that's coming off this loading motor here. Now perhaps we have to tip it up and look upside down. And it's going to auto off because it... Let's just see, can we fast forward? Yes, that works. Rewind. Nope. Mm, that's a shame. Okay, let's have a look through the front of the machine since we can see the reels in that mirror. There you can see the... There's the mirror. I think there's light... Oh, there was light bulbs there. But, yeah, they are blown, so... Yeah, that would normally light up the... the what's going on there. But the, the bulbs for the audio meters are still working. Fast forward works. Rewind. Not working. Interesting. I want to see this thing get into play mode, so let's tip it up and have a look in the bottom and see if we can uh, coax it into play mode. Just for one last time. For the lulls or whatever. And just to work out how to get this thing apart. I'll come back shortly. Okay, get to get to the bottom we have to take got the bottom panel off, but now it's just a massive frame of boards. So we have to under screws and they tell you what screws because there's a little diagram that shows screw next to it. And that's where the red screws are, although not all of them. It's some alternate colour solder mask on some of the tracks, which is very interesting. It's ready to swing out now. See, look at that. They put that indicator on the screws that you undo for servicing. Except that one and those ones for some reason they didn't. You can see there some tracks have got a blue colour on the solder mask. This is interesting. I not noticed that before. I wonder if that tells you something. Anyway, let's open this up. So we've got lots of good stuff going on in here. And if we put it in play, I'm uh, guessing something to do with this, because that's all the loading motor stuff. Power it up. Yeah, there you go. Got into play mode. This says unsupported signal. You can see that it's playing there. And on the, the waveform monitor there, it's just some noise, so 
Maybe the heads are fully clogged or it's got some other problem. So you can see you can do search with this knob forward sort of yeah backwards. That's different now. Is it stuck? Yeah it's stuck. Okay, we might try cleaning the heads and see if that improves it. I'm guessing this thing's had it though. I remember the other one that I looked inside a few years back. Uh, we'll probably need to get rid of the tape for this. It, so otherwise we're putting stuff on the tape. Yeah, it had capacitors leaking on a bunch of the boards, so it's pretty much had it. I can already see just from here on that board there's corrosion on a bunch of parts around the capacitors, so yeah, it's, it's finished. But yeah, there's a bit of crust coming off the head, so we'll just give that a little bit of a go, and then we'll take it apart, and we'll have a look at some of the boards and things. Now we'll just load this back up. Then we've got to get it into play mode, which uh, I guess it won't do it itself, will it? Nope. Yeah, that's the other problem, isn't it? Because it doesn't have take up or the. It can't rewind, so it leaves the tape. I don't know, it's fine that time anyway. I mean, it can now rewind? Nope. Oh, yeah, it's starting to be able to rewind a bit. Starting to be able to. Okay. Let's try to get it into play. Nope, it has not improved. Fiddling around with it, searching back and forth, I was able to get a brief glimpse of a picture every now and then. It just it flickers a picture, but in general, nothing. Looking at the waveform monitor, you see there is a waveform there. Uh, I guess with an analog forgiving monitor, I might be able to see a bit more. Adjusting the tracking does make it come and go. Just a hint of stuff pops up every now and then. So yeah, well it's definitely the capacitors, but it could be a bunch of other things as well. So we'll, so we'll give that a rest and we'll take it apart. Since that's what we're here for, we'll just get this tape out of it. Oh, tape the checks properly when it's up on its side like that. It's probably going to be very tedious to do it here, um, but let's just go. So it's made in a very serviceable way. Things can just flop out all over the place to help with getting access to circuits and things for servicing. And there's heaps of individual boards all over it. That thing there tips out, and then you get access to this. So there's three boards involved there. One on the top, and then the back's in front. I don't know what this does, I think this one just lifts out. Yeah, I wonder what that is. I guess we could look up the service manual, couldn't we? Find out what these things are. Probably got a service manual. I'll look for one. Let's just take the back off this so we can see what's behind this plate. Another board. So the one on the top seems kind of like an add-on, doesn't it? Just squeeze a little bit more circuitry in there. 4066. Little CMOS thing. Yeah, yeah. Everything's dark around the capacitors. So yeah, they're all leaking. And there's four red screws here which will take the tape loading mechanism off. And interesting that board in there is not very accessible because that's the main chassis piece there. And, but I, th I don't think it's that hard though. I think you can get it out from this side. Let's see. If we take the tape loading mechanism off, it should be just those four screws and then this connector here. Nice and easy. You can see the mirror there. 
the light bulbs. So I've made it pretty easy to replace that belt, which is nice. See, so just it'll just come off like that. Don't have to undo any mechanism. So much better than a lot of the VCRs where you got to take this whole shaft out to get access to the belt. And now the mechanism is there displayed for working on. This seems like the same base mechanism that's used in a lot of the other early 80s consumer VCRs. Same shape head, the same type of idler. Uh, so we'll probably come across that when we start looking at some of the other VCRs. But I think this will have a few more breaks and controls and things. See, there are hall sensors on, are they, or IR reflector? I don't know, what are these? To, so it can tell what the reels are doing, which will be part of knowing the the real-time counter thing and time remaining. And you see it did a half load wow, uh, uh, by bringing the tape up like that so that it's always in contact with the control head so it can count frames when you rewind and fast forward the tape. Interesting little bracket thing here. All the metalwork is really nice, very precisely folded. Everything has a part number so it can be identified. Everything will have a part number, every piece of stuff, all the metalwork has it printed on it. Oh yeah, so that might be the start of the HD audio, since the the cables that come off that go straight into this board. Let's see if that comes out through that slot. Yes, it's got red screws, so I guess this is the... These are the things you take off to access it. Yes, it's dropped down and some clips have undone. Will this lift out? Mm, not quite. I think we have to take the front off. I think those two screws there will take the control panel off. Let's try that. Oh, it springs out. Ah, you have to undo some screws from the bottom. I think that means now this would come out, would it? No, not quite. Now that's a bit of a a. A problem if you want to service that board there. Okay, that's some manuals. We're gonna have a look at one of these uh, in an upcoming video, and there's a picture of what the full remote looks like. We'll yeah try and find it so that we can uh, try it out with this thing. Though unfortunately, I think this is suffering the same as this, in that all the capacitors are leaked and it's wrecked. But we'll try. You can see there, on this board, how uh, the leaking of the capacitors has started corroding the parts around them. The diodes there with green crust on the legs. And on here you can see there's stains on the board around the capacitors. What a shame, because there are hundreds and hundreds of them in this machine. And yeah, they're all doing it. Ah, is there something on that head? Maybe it... what is that? Let's get the other camera and try looking even closer at to what's going on there. What is going on on that video head? Yeah, the focus seems to be messed up. It's got it got upside down, that's, what, that's one of the problems. Now, I've got this thing in... in focus. Now, maybe that explains it. Hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? Someone's cleaned the head with a fluffy thing. Maybe that's what's wrong with it. Is that all that's wrong with this machine? Dodgy video heads. Uh, looks like it's either scratched or corroding as well. I think we should try it again once uh, we tidy, tidy this up and then try try running it again. So I have several of these machines, well I had several of them, and none of them ever worked. So do you think that whoever had them before was a bit mean to them and um, you know, cleaned the head in a dodgy way that resulted in the head clogging like that? I need to find something that I can use to dust it out. Do you think using this crusty brush will help? I just want to flick stuff out of the head gap there. Looks like it. That's got rid of the crust. 
the crud that was in there. Let's just give this a little bit of a clean now to tidy that up. Just to get rid of the fingerprints and the like from it. Still pretty dirty. Alright. Um, yeah, we'll get rid of that. Well, we can have a look at it now. Re-look at it. Looks a little bit better, doesn't it? A little bit of fibre in the edge there. Looks better. Looks better. Oh, there's a little bit of fluff off that one. Okay, I'll try and tidy that up. Put it back together. Well, as much back together as we need. And we'll try it out again just to see did that change anything. It's back uh, in a working-ish condition. Uh, well, it's assembled enough that I can get the tape playing again. I got this other monitor because it will be a lot more forgiving than the... It's an analog monitor. And you can see that there is sort of a picture there, but it's lacking sync. It's even got a bit of colour in it any, every now and then. Just adjusting the tracking at the moment. So I think there's a problem with the servo stuff keeping things properly in sync. At a minimum, that's what's happened. So presumably it's because capacitors have leaked, the values have drifted, so timing is not what it used to be. Uh, which would suggest replacing all the capacitors would bring it back to life. Uh, but yeah, I'm not going to do that because I don't have weeks to organize and replace hundreds of capacitors. It's a 3 inch color CRT. Which is quite exciting. You don't get CRTs much smaller than that in colour. JVC TMP3. Annoyingly, they used a, a three and a half millimeter socket or plug for the audio. I don't know why. Yeah, BNC for the video, but for some bizarre reason, this for audio. Nothing has an audio output like that. Well, nothing that you normally come across. Anyway, this thing is, yeah, worse for wear. I did find a service manual for the other model. That's what I was thinking of, that has the knob on the front. So this is a 6800, this is 6100 and I didn't have any other closer models, but I'm pretty sure... There's an interesting controller too. Pretty sure this will be... Uh, pretty much the same adjustments. Well, it looks the same. What is different? Sometimes at the beginning of the service manual they tell you what's different. Yeah, this is the older one. Presumably. 83 by the look of it. 1983. The VHS format has been embraced by businessmen and educators alike. To meet the needs of these professionals, Panasonic has developed these. 4 head, 3 hour recording, aluminium die cast chassis, direct drive cylinder, full logic control, widely precise functions while maintaining superb picture quality, dial search. Talk about NTSC, but I'm pretty sure this was the PAL version. Yeah. Ah, so this is a multi system version. You see, they say there. TV system selector 33. So where's that there? So it's got two extra switches. Yeah, but this one has an audio record normal normal HD switch in the front. This one has a color mode, auto black and white color, and it has the system selector. So it looks like you can do recording and playback of PAL. And then playback of a modified NTC 443 and recording and playback of CCAM asterisk. Is that the asterisk there? I don't think so. 34. No, that's for the, the TV VTR selector, which must have an RF modulator in it. Because this doesn't have... Oh, there. Okay. So, yeah, this one doesn't have that. So there is a few different things, minor things. It's on that really nice smooth paper that they used to use on the 
good old stuff, early 80s. So that RCA for record remote that we saw on the back says that's for dubbing or edit from master VCRs. Okay, so that means yeah, you can use a distributor and then that signal will, can trigger the I see. So that links through all the machines, so it triggers the start of recording and probably the stop of recording. Oh yeah, the RF modulator is an optional thing which you can plug into the back of it on that model. I was looking for an overview so that we can have a look at the uh, the parts in this. See maintenance chart when you should replace the different bits inside it. Opening it. Perhaps we should eject this. And they need to be playing this whole time, does it? I was hoping there'd be a a diagram that shows where the boards are, but nope. This is the best I could find. So on the side here, it says opening the audio circuit board, and it's talking about H. So that's this. So this thing here, hinged stuff. That's the audio. All of that. And then it says, opening system control, screws I. So that's this thing. That's system control board. So that must have some CPUs and things on it. And then it says, unscrew 6J, which is the bottom. And that's opening the servo and luminance and chrominance board. So that's what's at the bottom there. The one that flaps out from the bottom, luminance and chrominance, and servo, and it doesn't go into any of the others. So we already decided that that there's the hi-fi audio board, and I haven't looked at those yet. Let's see what those are. The exploded views are pretty interesting. So there's a description of what all the parts are, all the mechanical parts. I'll take this off so we can actually look at it nicely. So it's an inertia roller, supply limiter. And so this one has a real motor, not coupled to the capstair motor, which helps with the trick play type stuff. It's interesting that when you press the buttons on the front for fast forward rewind, it, it stops playing and then goes into rewind and fast forward. There's no cue and review mode. But if you use the remote controller, then you could do that through the search function. So it has more features available than what it you can access from the front panel. It has, it has exploded view of the mechanical, so that's one that doesn't have hi-fi sound, is it? Or they routed it differently. We'll look at that. Yeah, maybe they changed it in this model that we've got here. Exploded views of the chassis. More. Cool apart the front loading mechanism. And then that's how the whole frame goes together. All the little bits and pieces. And then casing. With the front panel. And then more of that. And then how to wrap it up and put it in the box. Then we've got parts lists. It's interesting there's different wires there that you see they color code that two pin. I guess it's because things like the light bulb go to and the cassette in switch will go to different places. Looks like it, it looks like the light bulbs of that one. Also looks like the driver for this motor is right there. And there's the switches for once the cassette is in, it pushes that switch, which is what it couldn't get to uh, because the belt was slipping and not quite enough torque to push that switch. Now we'll see what this board is. I don't know, what does it join onto? Is it perhaps to do with the audio? I wonder if that those wires coming over here? Not sure. Some power regulator stuff there. Oh, I see. This one, you can slide it over and it comes off. So what is that? More stuff that is kind of unlabeled. I can't really get this bits out without taking more stuff off. We see here the, the front panel here got lots, lots of stuff on the front panel. It's got its own whole CPU thing, I think. Yeah, it says on it, look, front CPU, that one actually has, it 
the function labeled on it. Self tapping screws into plastic. And it's one of those EDC dip type CPUs bored with the meters. Yeah, because there's audio recording level adjustments on the front for normal and hi fi audio. So all of those signals have to come out to there. And the counter display board comes out. Interesting that there is the provision on the on the board for the search dial, it's just not there. And I wonder would it work if you put one there? No, it won't because though it goes to that header there, or well, those pads which only has one little wire in it, so I think they've linked it out. You see there is a link on there joining some pads together. So yeah, you wouldn't go to add that. There's also on here the provision for microphone inputs. Now there's a ground wire to the front metalwork, just I guess to screen the shield of the audio circuits, picking up noise from people being near it. So there's provision there on that board for uh, two microphone inputs and probably the preamps related to those and a slow tracking control. Hmm, okay, but none of that stuff is fitted. Slow tracking. That's interesting. But does the one with the search dial on there have slow tracking control? Not sure. Let's see. It's hard to see. It does. Look at that. But it doesn't have the microphones. Ah, but there's two. This is the 6100. The 6 something else 100 has got its own page. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it does. Look at that. So 6200 has got the slow tracking and the microphone inputs. Okay, there you go, that's... Must use the same blank PCB then. It just has more stuff fitted on it. Oh look, someone's replaced the light bulb there. I've put in one of those... Oops. One of those lights... Light bulbs that's like a fuse. You get on some old hi-fi equipment. The original, the original bulbs there must have blown long ago, like the ones did in the cassette thing, and someone has soldered in this light bulb. It wasn't me. It's just doing something that happened. Wherever, by whoever used to use this thing. I don't know where it came from. Just got given it with a bunch of other VCRs quite a long time ago. A whole stack of VCRs of various types. So there's the controls. Ah, so there's options for quite a few more controls there though they're not labelled as to what they would be it would be a different moulding that moulds on these I guess is that true? or are they clipped on? Well, I think they might be clipped on the coloured parts clipped onto that and then sort of squished over Interesting. There's little dual diode packages in these three terminal things that look like transistors. So there must be some sort of grid that gets scanned. Front panel with aluminium. Okay, what else do we need to look at? I want to see where the wires for this thing and this thing go so we can discover what it is. Let's see if we can take out the mechanism. I think we won't be able to do that until quite a few more wires and things have been moved out of the way. Some screws holding this at the back. There's a screw down here that's got a bracket off of it. Mechanism. And the problem is there's a big bunch of wires there that would have to get cut in order to determine uh, what, where they go. I made it difficult by pulling up all this front stuff because that's now going to flop down. Put the screw back in the top. Going to untangle some of this wires. Found there are more labels on these boards, they're just down the bottom. That's Audio 2, 
Audio 1. This one is undescribed. This here says their Psycon circuit system control. I've cut off a lot of the ties now on the cables. They're tied with these plastic cord stuff, which is much nicer than using tape. And uh, this thing here, that is, doesn't say what it is, but it's got labeled pots on it, variable resistors. It says channel 1 linear level, 2 linear level, channel 1 FM level, channel 2 FM level. So it's a, it must be just like a little amplifier thing. Amplifier and level control. All the caps on it are gone bad and are corroding. This one here, it's called audio control. So that has, oh yeah, it says meters. So it must be providing the signal up to the meters on the front. Not sure if they... It goes all the way to the meters, maybe. Yeah, audio control. And then on the bottom board, you can see this cable harness has a part number. So that must be made as one piece. And it was one piece until I cut the, the tires off of it. So that must be supplied as one thing that then gets laid in and hooked up during assembly. It's quite a complicated thing which goes out to heaps of individual connectors and they're all different numbers of ways and then where they're not different numbers of ways they're color coded with different colored connectors. Sort of red ones, black ones, brown ones. And then there's the bottom of the mechanism in there. I'll probably pull that out so we can explore it a little bit more. Let's do that. Yeah, it's probably going to fall out if I'm not careful because we undid all the screws. Okay. Okay, so it's stuck by the, uh, the, the audio cables. That we can get rid of. Oh, there's another type of tie on that. Oh, those don't come off. They're soldered. You see, it's test points on the top with a little connector, but they are... Uh, they must have got ripped out of whatever it was plugged into. Anyway, so we're going to have to follow the wires over to here. I don't know which side they go on. Open up this board and disconnect the wires from there. It comes in there, there. And shielded wires going from there and there. It must be fun re assembling these things in the factory. So much fiddling around with wires. Ah, and that now we got the signal that comes off the video head. I'm guessing that's not a connector. Hmm, weird. Oh, it is a connector. Let's take this top piece off and then we should be able to get to that connector so we can do it that way. Let's see what's under this thing. I'm guessing it's just the coupling for the hi-fi part. Yep. Okay, look at that now we've exposed some connectors. There must be a reason why they've gone to top mounting those. Oh, there was another signal. Of course there was another signal now, where does that go? Yep, wrapped around heaps of stuff. Okay, got the mechanism out. Let's get rid of this and we'll then we'll take a little look at the mechanism. Well perhaps first we'll take the back cover off and have a look at where all the I.O. things connect onto it. It's got feet on the back so you can if you tip it on its back, it rests on that and it doesn't squish the connectors. So you can't have anything plugged into it when you're doing that, but it is a useful way of storing them on their backs so that they can sit there in a row and be individually picked out without having to be stacked. Oh, it's an aluminium back panel. The power cord gone. Look at this. See, every sticker 
that's stuck on there has got a part number everything has a part number and this middle itself should have one too somewhere somewhere I don't know maybe it's under one of those stickers ah, now there's more stuff to go in to get I want to see things like the hour meter okay the back panel is coming off ah oh, there's another whole CPU thing involved with the remote interface connector yeah it's like a big collection of ground wires there all under one screw don't think we can take this board out because it's been put on after the connectors have been mounted onto chassis yeah so that won't come out but yeah there's not much to it it's just going from cable assemblies to the connectors and a couple of components I also want to see how dodgy this the power cable on this is definitely not the original one someone's added that and I want to see how dodgy the connection has been made to it which seems to be in there I don't know what we we just cut it off oh, I'll rip it out of the cord clamp okay is it joined in there? No, they've done it. They've done it right into the switch. Okay, so that's not too bad. Thought there was going to be some really dodgy join under there, but it's fine. Now the hour meter. That is. It's just something that looks like a fuse. It's the same form factor as a fuse, but it's some kind of thing. I don't know what that is exactly. It might be mercury. Was that possible? Or some other kind of metal where. I think a bubble moves across it, 0 to 10, but it's always times 100, I think. I don't know, I guess it depends on how much current you apply to it, because that says it's 0 to 5,000 hours, and then after that you'd have to get a new one of these. So yeah, that's that's the hour meter. Interesting little thing that you find in a lot of professional equipment, just so you can count how long it's been powered on for. Now there's a power supply board in the back, there's a transformer, there's a bit of mains circuitry on there. Uh, yeah, because it's got, oh it's just a filter which brings the AC in through a fuse and a filter, then back off to the primary of the transformer. And it's all hardwired, the transformer, it's not, no connector there. It's one of those ring core, I can't remember what that's called. Is it an O core? It's kind of like a toroid where the windings don't go the whole way around, so two bobbins but in a, a ring. Yeah, sort of a toroidal transformer, but I guess it's easy to manufacture. I think you have to wind the bobbins with the copper and then the core gets wound around them because it's made of one strip of steel that gets threaded through and it's already shaped so it makes that round shape once it's done there's a power supply board to get a bunch of little things off first to look at that because there's cable clamps and then there's the heat sink stuff down here oh, that screw goes to nothing the power supply board mounted on this aluminium plate because it's got some regulators there and there and then off the board and sort of related what is that there's two more little thingies there which seem to be i think they're just secured onto this aluminium they're not making use of it although maybe those are the temperature sensors well, they are. Maybe they are temperature sensors because they've got a, a flat area of copper over where the heatsink is. So it looks like it is intended to couple onto the heatsink. And it's very twisted. Oh, and it's the fan wires come off of it. I don't know why they've twisted those wires so much. But yeah, I think they're using those thingies there. I guess they're just transistors to measure the temperature you can see how the there's a copper area there that would be fairly well it says fun on it fun good fun 
I think that means fan, but the photo if you in on both sides. Okay. Fun! So only one of them's replaced power supply board. There. And the other one comes from some other power supply thing that's somewhere else. Great, so that's power supply. And the regulators are types that where they use a zener and then a pass transistor. See that stuff down there is a zener and then there's a transistor. A lot of leaking caps making the board go all dark. As you do, some full bridge rectifiers. And I think that's us for the electrical stuff. We've explored all sides of this thing. Still can't get that out. What was, oh that's the hi-fi audio board isn't it? There's some date codes I think stamped onto these things, but I think that's Japanese dates. It says 59-4-23. 59 sounds like a Japanese date, doesn't it? Japanese year. Should give us enough room to lift this out. Ah, oh, but it's got all its own wires on the bottom holding it in place, isn't it? Oh, I've unleashed a mighty stink from that. Get it up. Go like that. We'll unplug the plugs. One little thing. Okay, so that will be the... They call it HD audio. Oh, FM audio. Yeah, it's got surface mount stuff. Double-sided through-hole plated board. Is that the only one in this machine? Could be. Uh, I think so. Oh, that's fancy. Rotting caps all over it. Corroding the board, great. That's some pretty decent film caps too. And yeah, it's corroding. It's got these satellite boards. Audio emphasis. VJB. VJB. Yeah, so that's where the signal from those... That top thingy. That guy, which is the other like RF transformer, picks up from the video head. Well, this picks up the audio. Goes into here, there will be some heat amp stuff going on in here, and then the FM demodulating and all that business. Yeah, so they tell you there where the ICs are on the bottom and what they are, which is quite nice. DBX, shielded links. See the symbol there? It shows that point going into a shield, and then it comes out. There. And we can't see the diagram of that coming out. But they've grounded the shield at one end. I wonder if there's a ground plane. Would this be a multi-layer board? They've glued the screws in place. Another piece of metalwork with a part number on it. And you can see there the icon which, or the, the little drawing which shows the signal coming out of the shield and then the shield as well gets grounded. The little line that tells you where it gets grounded. Is this an NEC branded board? So I guess they manufactured the blank boards, NEC. I wonder who did the other ones. That was the same. I didn't see NEC logo on any of the others. Because there's a special... Yeah, it's these guys. Whoever that is. JPMFS. Yeah, NEC. To the manufacturer of boards and possibly whole assemblies. You can see some dark bits in the board where the caps on the other side have leaked and started wrecking it. And they've left off some filters, they just put a link there being one of those filter can things with a inductor in it and a slug going through it. Okay, there's that. And I remembered to record it. Which... Finally, let's have a little look at the mechanical part. Normal VHS mechanics. It's just a weird head. Video head. Let's see, does that... Is that shaft continuous the whole way through? This will take the whole video head out so we can expect it. Oh, it's one of those ones with a big motor on the bottom. I'm wondering, is this a newer machine than the one in the service manual? That's probably because the model number's higher for this one. So I'm wondering, did they start off with the uh, signal, the video head signal, including the audio on the bottom edge? and then realize there was a problem with that and then improve it in this machine to bring the audio pickups to the top to get them away from the video pickups. Is that possible? Or is this an older design? Ah, hang on. 
in the NV850, which we haven't got to yet, which we're gonna do a video on. Pretty sure that has top pickup as well. So maybe that was an improved thing that they did for a while, maybe? Yeah, so you can actually see the high frequency transformer that couples the signal to sit there almost touching each other and see does the shaft come with it? It does. Hmm, okay. So it's just a regular video head under that. That's just an add-on to it, which brings that transformer and the little grounding post. So that means that, because it's not uh, flying a race heads, is it? Because those uh, take, or is it? I think, no, because that goes to the audio board. Yeah, so that's definitely the hi-fi audio. So I'm wondering, I don't think this has insert editing. Because the other thing is, the wires that went into this, they were only populated... Like some of them were populated, not all of them. Don't worry, I have another one of these heads if I want a good one. I have a whole other mechanism out of one of these VCRs. It's okay if we destroy this one. Because it looks like it's still got all of the pickups here. All four of them. Well, let's take that out and have a look. So that's the stator and long screws. And there's the head motor with a bodge on it. Wow. Oh, so it uses magnetic pickups for the position. See that? Six of those things. And then there's the FG pulse. Comes from a little thingy on the outside there. So if we get a hex thing to undo that. Huh, why isn't that coming out? There you go, it came out. It's very interesting because that has already four pickups. Do you think that would be enough since there's four heads, each one's only got one coil on it? Is that true or do they go to ground? So each one has two. Well if that was true then you need a ground pickup, wouldn't you? So the heads come up to these things there because it's spaced apart. So there's two together and then there's the two on their ends. So that goes to the top one. That goes to a top one. So is that one those two there go to the top. Ah, oh, but see that? Those two there, which went to the bottom pickups, those are just shorted together. That one and that one are just shorted out. They don't go to anything. I don't know. I'm not sure. I suppose we could look in the manual, but... Anyway, that's the head. Head assembly with its HF transformer thingies. Pretty munted head, as we saw before, with its... Um, the fluff was stuck in it. So it's the normal stuff. There's a supply reel. There's the guides which wind themselves out. The back tension band, which is still on there. It hasn't fallen off, so that's pretty good. So quite often that goes bad. And just the... Oh no, it has flaked off. Well, I guess now I've disturbed it. Yeah, that just flakes off and then you lose the back tension and usually find the audio goes bad that's one of the signs or well, the picture is really bad other than in queue and view mode see that's a hall effect device you see there's a magnet multipole magnet magnetic viewing film and there you go look at that multipole magnet lots of poles so that would be giving a lot of pulses on that hall device as this turns so it can have a very precise knowledge of its position that's quite neat and we the same on that one and then there's that roller for the race head the video head then there's that other roller the audio and control head or linear audio and control head then a capstan pinch roller which pushes against it and then there's a little hook thing to open the flap and then back to the take up reel and the idler there which is directly pressing on the output shaft of the motor. So that drives the, the reels for all modes of the wind, fast forward and play. How do you replace the idler? I think you have to take the whole mechanism off. That tire, the tire around the idler will go bad. And then you have to take all this stuff apart to get it off, I think. 
Yeah, that comes out as one piece, but the brakes are in the way. Oh, I think if you slide it all the way over, there you go. Did I wreck it? Oh yeah, you just got to get it behind that piece there, and then yeah, you can replace the, the tire on that. I think it's, it's not the worst I've seen. It's still got a little bit of life left in it. Pintrol is not the best, it's got a shiny bit on it. Capstan is in okay condition. Capstan mode is one of those real big ones. Older style mode switch there. Goes up to a connector so that can be replaced as one piece. Is the real motor. Interesting that pancake style motor. It's probably been through a few of these in its life, but I don't think this has been replaced because see how worn that is in comparison to the idler there. So it's just getting away with put a good one of these on and it will just live with that. You can also see the dust that's come off these as they get worn out. Loading mechanism. Now there's the thrust plate for the capstan motor. Oh yeah, I don't think we need to take that off, do we? Because we can take out the motor as it is. Oh, it's all in one there with the, um, you know, the bearing as part of this assembly. But often these are more deconstructed form as we saw in the NV870 where the bearing part stays in the chassis and the stator windings and things are then just screwed down to the chassis but this one is separate able so that piece there could go back onto it should we take it apart though to, and have a look at the windings in there if you take this plastic ring off Oh, look at that, it's got an actual optical encoder. See, it's... Oh, it's a cunning one, is it? No, it's two... Yeah, so it's an incremental encoder. See two LEDs there. And then you've got the... Uh, the... What do you call that? The grate? That has a screen on it. And then there'll be two light sensors in there. Appear to be joined in series, which is interesting. Maybe it doesn't sense direction, it's only the... Uh, just the movement that it's looking at. Uh, so there's the stator for that and magnet around there. That's really interesting. The grating. So that must work with that to make a very fine slit available so that it's it, it can determine the precise position of it. You can kind of see that in there. See it jumping as it passes. Not very easily, I think that will get compressed out, won't it? There you go, you can see that opening and closing. Yeah, so that could work as an incremental encoder, because you can see there how they open and close alternatively. What an interesting thing, I don't think I've seen that in these before. I guess I didn't look hard enough, or I can't remember. And then down the bottom here, we've got the mode switch. It's like that, which is a slide switch with a bunch of different positions in the keys into that and can be calibrated with that see that's been some glue put on it keep position that's a slotted thing that will be a slotted thing too so that, that can adjust to set up the exact position for the mode switch and yeah that's just some gears which you can see wind out the uh, loading arms to bring the tape out and wrap it around the head. Dew sensor in case the temperature changes and condensation starts forming on the head, which you do not want. There you go, that's the mechanism. Okay, I was mistaken. I was mistaken about the sensing on this. And the reason why those two are in series is because those are the LEDs. The receivers are on this side. Uh, because those are separated and they do say they're common collector and then FG1 and FG2 so the sensing is on the top and it is operating like an incremental encoder now the date on the middle work which 59423 I believe that is Japanese date from their 
59, Showa era 59, 1984. That correlates with the likely age of this machine. So it was, must be from 1984. As we saw on that service manual, it says 83. So that correlates. It's likely manufactured in 1984. So hopefully you enjoyed that. A look at the Panasonic AG 6800, somewhat industrial, professional-ish VCR from the mid-80s.